Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. Um, <clears throat> it's September now, post Labor Day, and this is historically, typically we're Kids go back to school, and um, I always thought of it as the start of a new year, and not just another school year. It was sort of a, uh, a transition. <clears throat> um, I always, uh, I was one of those weird kids who actually liked going to school and there were a number of reasons behind that that we needn't go into right now, but it is the case. So I was thinking about the talks that we've given over the last couple years. And uh, it dawned on me that none of them were specifically about the mechanics, let's say, of of Zen. So tonight I wanted to talk about the how and why of Zen, starting with how to sit in meditation, and then we'll go into the why of meditation later. But the typical meditation posture, and you'll have some some images on screen to help us with that because on Zoom it's kind of tough to actually do all this stuff. So for starters, the historical way was uh, to do it by way of uh, full lotus position. And that's where left leg goes on top of right, right leg goes on top of left, the palms of the feet, if you like, are both pointed upwards and um, you would sit in meditation in that way. If, like some of us, you're no longer quite so flexible anymore, there is, of course, the half lotus position, which is uh, one leg up and the other one down, so right leg on top of left thigh and left shin uh, firmly on the ground. And the, um, the point of both of those and, and all these postures in general is that we found, uh, find ourselves in a tripod position where um, we're firmly grounded, sitting on like the first third of the meditation cushion and with the knees as supports. So you've got that, that butt, knee, knee triangle going and it's very solid. And there's a reason that we do that. So there's another uh, method of sitting still on a cushion, and that one is called Burmese style, which um, basically the shins are parallel to the ground and neither foot is on top of either thigh. But again, it's the same tripod. This, when uh, <clears throat> I found that when wearing full robes, that trying to get into lotus or half lotus position was a pretty effective way to get me to fall over. So Burmese was a pretty reasonable uh, way of sitting. Um, there are others. Not everyone can get down onto a cushion, so uh, there's the, um, you can straddle a cushion, 
which is basically a lot of people will take the the meditation cushion itself and turn it upright so that it's a little further off the floor so you're not in the typical um, knees and, and butt on cushion and mat kind of position. Uh, there's a little bit more of a, a raise to it, so a lot of people find it easier um, not to have to go down as far. Um, another way, of course, is on a chair, and that's certainly perfectly reasonable. Um, we do the same thing uh, our feet are flat on the floor and our back is in the same position. Our head is in the same position as it is in all of the other uh, methods of, of sitting. Basically, the, the nose and navel are in line with each other. The shoulders are relaxed. Even though you're maintaining a pretty strict posture, it's not a tight posture. So shoulders are relaxed, hands are relaxed, legs are relaxed, and yet you still have the nose and navel aligned. You take your eyes and you shut them halfway, let's say. And then, depending on uh, your circumstances, uh, some people say to gaze out six feet ahead, which on Zoom, of course, is rather difficult because I would be looking through a wall in order to do that, but it's generally speaking glance down at the floor or whatever surface is in front of you at like a 45 degree angle and you don't focus on anything in particular. You just let the eyes be aware of the surroundings. Um, funny little aside I have in that regard, I was at a temple once and uh, I was sitting in a corner near a column and some joker decided that drawing a little dot on this column would be a good focal point. Well, it was. I couldn't help, you know, my eyes would keep on raising up to see that darn dot. There's another instance where there was a bug crawling on the floor in front of me, which in meditation I found absolutely fascinating. So, uh, yeah, we try and just be aware of our surroundings, but uh, sometimes our surroundings can be very intriguing, um, especially when they're a little black dot on a column, apparently. So we've got the back, we've got the eyes. Now, how do we breathe? And in our tradition, uh, we breathe totally naturally. You breathe through the nose. Some people will breathe in and then breathe out a longer period so that the the lungs are further are fully uh, release the air carbon monoxide in this case but it's a natural thing we don't like press ourselves into doing it it's just inhale exhale it might last longer than the inhale does. Um, with all of this, there is no good or bad about it. 
sitting in full lotus is no better than half lotus is no better than on a chair. Sitting in full lotus with your right leg over your uh, left thigh uh, is no better than sitting there with your left leg over your right, your left foot over your right thigh. It's natural. It's our natural state. So we devote our mind and body into meditation. We don't strive for anything. We don't, um, you know, say, oh, I'm not doing this right. Uh, I'm, I'm a bad zenny. We just catch ourselves if our uh, posture isn't so great, then we just straighten up. If, um, you know, your eyes are totally shut and you're starting to doze off and you realize it, open your eyes a little bit and refocus. We're not sitting in meditation to be judgmental of ourselves. We're sitting in meditation to meditate, period. And we'll go into the why of that a little, a little long, uh, later, but, um, so the, uh, there's even a suggestion of what to do with the tongue while you're meditating. So, uh, the idea is that you're breathing in through the mouth, uh, through the nose and then out through the nose if possible, out through the mouth if necessary, but the tip of the tongue is basically pressed against uh, your upper palate, like right behind your two front teeth. And the reason for that is apparently that lessens the amount of saliva that uh, your mouth produces, which I've I've never really evaluated whether that's true or not. I've never been able to quantify the amount of saliva, you know, with tongue pressed behind teeth or not. But I'll, you know, somebody probably did at some point somewhere around a thousand years ago. So I'll take their word for it. Um, there are some other things that we do. And um, it's with the hands. And the hands, as are being shown in this image, are right hand on the bottom, left hand on top. Knuckles align, the middle knuckles align. And... Personally, I go for a slightly larger oval uh, when doing the cosmic mudra. But that's the idea, is right hand bottom, left hand on top of it, knuckles aligned, and thumbs just barely touching. I was once told that your, your thumbs should touch, but only as far as would allow a piece of paper to slide between them. So it's not tight, not loose, just barely in contact. And that's what we do with our, with our hands. Now, in, uh, Thank you for sharing all the images, by the way, Johnson. Appreciated. So um, we got the legs, we got the spine, we got the head, we got the breathing. So what do we do with the other things that are involved in our practice? One thing we do is try and focus on uh, what the um, 
the Koreans call Danjan, the Japanese call Hara, uh, Chinese call it Tantian, and it's basically that area like two inches below your navel, uh, the chi center, and we focus our energy onto that. Again, it's not a conscious, oh, I'm going to focus my energy. It's more of a, okay, this is where my center is. And we just deal with that. A lot of people will actually, um, on both inhale and exhale, will thrust their, their belly out a little bit in order to keep uh, focused on the, uh, on the dungeon. In our tradition, as Zen Master Sung San would often say, um, this is your don't know center. This is our just do it center. So we focus on that. Now, okay, so we got all of that physical stuff taken care of, right? But now comes that thing between the ears which will drive us nuts if we let it. So a lot of people when they're just starting out will be told in order to focus your attention, in order to keep your mind from wandering, in order to keep your mind from thinking, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Geez, I really wish I would have flipped that guy off when he cut me off in traffic. Having arguments with other people who aren't actually in the same room with you. All of that is detrimental to our practice. It's not to say that it doesn't happen, and regardless of how long you've been doing it, it may still happen. Uh, you could be a rank be beginner sitting for the second time and, uh, you know, accomplish the, the state that's sometimes called no mind. But a lot of people are told when they start to, um, uh, on the exhales and the inhales, you gauge them, you, uh, set them up so that each inhale or exhale corresponds to a number. Now, personally, I've always started with the exhale as one and inhale as two and exhale on three, inhale on four, so on and so forth, up to 10. And the reason that I start counting on the exhale is because for me anyway, that's the act of letting go. That's the antithesis of desire. I mean, when you want to stay alive, you're pretty fond of inhaling, right? Exhaling will follow along too, but that's, inhaling is that act of desire. I want to stay alive. So I always start counting or whatever on the exhale. That's just me. Um, there are, are some other things that people can do when they're beginners. Um, one of them is, is chanting something softly, you know, quietly, silently to yourself, such as, uh, clear mind, clear mind, clear mind, don't know. Clear mind, clear mind, clear mind, 
don't know. Uh, I know of a teacher in our order who um, has her students do a, uh, a what is this, don't know, as a what is this, inhale, don't know, exhale. And again, it's, it's not going to be 100% effective at all times, but hopefully it will shove the thoughts of dinner and the guy that caught you off on the road a little further away from occupying all of your thought. Um, personally, a lot of times when I'm meditating, I'll actually silently cheat uh, Namu Amida Bull to myself. And you find that most mantras seem to have six syllables to them, and that's mine. Na on the exhale, Mu on the inhale, Ah, uh, Mi, Ta, Bull, and then back down to Na. And that's basically uh, the Korean, uh, I take refuge in Amitabha Buddha. Um, other people will chant Kwan Seom Bo Sal, Kwan Seom Bo Sal, silently to themselves as they breathe in and out. And um, another way to do it, and um, this may or may not be appropriate if you are not working with a teacher, but there is the Huadu that uh, can often be used uh, both as a means to keeping uh, your mind focused on your meditation um, and it's also in a more advanced state uh, the intense questioning and like I said one teacher I know does what is this don't know uh, what is this is one of the more common wadus um, who am I is another uh, there are any number of them along those lines. But again, I say this as a, um, a caveat that it would be best if uh, there were a teacher involved. Um, my teacher gave me a particular wadu to use in my practice. And the idea is that the wadu is kept close to the heart all day, all night, at work, at rest, at play, whatever the, the Huadu, what is this, what is this, what is this, is always kept uh, close to the heart. So now we have all of the hows. Somebody could watch this video and in theory, get themselves a mat and a cushion and follow all those instructions and look at the Quanum website and the Choge International website and, um, you know, get the images that uh, Johnson so uh, generously shared with us. Um, now, here's the why. Why do we practice then? A lot of people will start off meditating because it's going to give them that sense of peace and well-being and uh, all is right and, you know, we are the world and everything is unified and all good. And um, sure, that's certainly one of the aspects to it. Um, others may come to it out of a sense of 
coming from a, another religion that just plain wasn't working anymore. Um, the reasons of why are all very personal and the effects that are, are gained from meditation are also intensely personal and individual. When I meditate, what happens with me is not going to be the same thing that happens with you. There is no universal state of no mind like everybody experiences the same no mind. You know, I can sit here in the new hermitage and the lights are dimmer than my old place. There are certainly fewer motorcycles going by here. Uh, there was a dog that was kind of barking away for a while there. But when sitting, it doesn't have to be dark. It doesn't have to be silent. It can be bright. It can be noisy. We maintain our Zen mind, right? Whatever form that may take, we keep that. We stay focused in whatever uh, way we need to, be it counting, be it chanting, be it uh, just observing the breath. You know, there are plenty of people who will count up to 10 and then start over at one again and it's all good. And then the next thing you know, they're on 15 and oops, back to one but without any judgment about having hit 15. So maybe that's the, the most crucial benefit that we can get from meditation is that when we're in the process of meditating, we leave aside, we put down all the judgments. Oh, I'm not doing this right. Look, their posture is totally wrong. Right? We can put aside those judgments and then when we get off the cushion, we can apply that more naturally in our other circumstances. When the guy cuts you off in traffic, when dinner arrives and it's cold and the waiter doesn't seem to care, not good, not bad. We observe from moment to moment to moment. We maintain our equilibrium, if you like, our equanimity as best we can. And when we lose it, again, no judgment. We keep meditating to help us find our true nature, to see our original face. It's tough to do it without meditation is what I've found. It's not just on the cushion, although that is probably the easiest place to meditate and to maintain that that correct buddha mind there are fewer distractions you might be staring at a wall you might be staring at the practitioner across from you in our uh tradition people sit in a row facing the uh statue of the buddha and the guiding teacher at the front. Um, not good, not bad. Just focus, focus, focus without 
expending any energy in the focusing. May all beings be happy. May you save all sentient beings. Thank you.